Good afternoon. My name is Georgette Haroon, and I'm a graduate student at York University studying fire and civil engineering with the supervision of John Gales. And today I'm going to talk to you about heritage implications in egress and modeling. So first, I want to introduce the common intersection of cultural centers and heritage buildings. Uh, so the image on the slide is not of this project, but it's another example of a cultural center housed in a heritage building, which is a quite common occurrence. So cultural centers um, are often contain valuable property that needs specific conditions to be preserved. So this just adds another element, um, another constraint when considering making any changes to a cultural center. So whether the building was originally a cultural center or not, um, there are a great use of these large scale heritage buildings that often go through many occupancy changes. For example, there are many large religious buildings um, that have been repurposed into schools and cultural centers. And these occupancy changes bring fire safety concerns with them. So the combination of valuable and often fragile property within the building, uh, coupled with the inherent value of the building as a heritage structure, um, creates extra challenges when considering making any changes to the building, um, even though changes are often necessary to ensure occupants fire safety. So I also wanted to address how heritage buildings um, have specific challenges with regards to emergency egress. First of all, um, many of them, I would say most, are built before modern building codes. So in Canada, where I'm from, that would mean any building built before 1940s, and that definitely includes the building that we'll be talking about today. Um, and because they're built before these codes were created, um, they are not built to code. And as they're renovated and repurposed, they must be brought into modern fire safety standards uh, without interfering with any of the protected heritage attributes. So since major changes to the building aren't recommended, specialized solutions are needed for fire safety measures. So this research project came about from an opportunity to record emergency egress drills from a cultural center housed in a heritage building. So here um, in this study, two scenarios are considered based on two recorded events at the cultural center at different occasions, and they'll be referred to as scenario one and scenario two um, based on the real data collected from 448 minutes of video footage from 47 closed caption television cameras in the building. So this slide shows the floor plan of the cultural center with the real exit usage rates of all the available exits. Um, so this specifically shows the rates for scenario one, where there were a little over 1700 occupants. The purpose of this diagram is to show that most of the occupants used uh, the main exit to, during their emergency egress, um, which is true for scenario two as well, even though we won't get specifically into the numbers. I also wanted to highlight some of the exits shown on this slide. Um, so the main ex entrance um, is highlighted in pink, but there are two other exits that I wanted to draw your attention to on the sides. So these three exits um, are actually the only original exits to the building. So when it was built, these were the only ones available for egress, and all of the additional exits were added uh, at a later date um, to improve the egress, presumably. So from the data collected from multiple real events to the unique nature of the building as having heritage status, the research goals were formulated. So the purpose of the study is twofold. One, to verify our model and to validate the movement speeds and to um, as well to explore and address the challenges regarding evacuation modeling in heritage buildings. So the validation and verification were done in two separate movement modeling software to compare their performance. 
Now, the intention of this comparison is not to critically evaluate either software, but only to confirm that software with similar background will provide similar analyses. Uh, therefore, in this presentation, we'll refer to the software only as software A and software B. So a movement profile was generated from the evacuation footage collected from scenario one and scenario two, and the following information was extracted from the data using novel software that will be discussed on the next slide. So all of these parameters, the movement speeds, the pre-evacuation time, and the exit use rates, um, were kept consistent between the software because the validation of the movement speed was not meant to evaluate the decision-making process in either software. And for the exit use rates, um, they only changed between scenario one and two, which they did in uh, the real events, but they did not change between the software. So the movement speeds were determined using Kinovia freeware, as well as an additional post-processing code, which facilitated the generation of the movement speeds. So normally, Kinovia can track user-specified objects in videos and correct for lens and angle distortion. Um, but we needed a little bit more uh, for our analysis, so the post-processing code was developed to allow it to generate average speeds for entire populations and also accommodate any duplicate frames in the footage. So frame duplicates are an important consideration because um, if they're not removed from the data, they'll create a false movement speed of zero that will artificially lower the average speed overall. Um, so those are taken into consideration with the code and doesn't affect the data unnecessarily. And the code can also generate different movement speeds for specific populations that are tagged manually. So in this case, the population was tagged uh, to be in different age brackets. Um, and so that age demographic was um, used in the breakdowns. So here you can see the summarized movement profile that was generated. Um, you can see the recorded pre-evacuation time in seconds, which ranges from zero seconds to uh, 210 seconds um, in five second or 10 second increments, uh, as well as the average movement speed for the cultural center. Uh, so the speeds that were inputted into the software, of course, were broken down by demographic, as I discussed on the last slide. Um, and so that full breakdown was used in both software. As previously mentioned, uh, the modeling was completed in two separate software, and the model for the cultural center, as seen in this slide, uh, was created in SketchUp and used in both software A and B so that they had the same base. All of the parameters found from the evacuation data from scenario one and two were inputted into the models, so the pre-evacuation time, the movement speeds, and the exit use rates. The validation of the movement speeds were conducted by comparing the main exit use rates, which were the exits used predominantly in both scenarios. So the following graph shows uh, the real data in black, and as well as the analysis from software A and B for the main exit in scenario one. So initially, if you look uh, before the 100 second mark, Software B, which is in blue, follows the real curve a bit uh, more closely, and software A in yellow has a bit of a steeper uh, slope. But after 200 seconds, um, software A starts to follow the real trend of a slowing exit rate, and software B follows that trend 50 seconds later at 250 seconds. But overall, the trends were very similar, and the exit counts for both software and the real scenario are around 70%. So this second graph shows um, the same exit use rate between the recorded event, again in black, and for scenario um, the two software, but this is for scenario two, which has a lower population count. So initially, uh, the real exit slope um, increases faster than both software before software A and B catches up and actually ends up with a steeper slope in the end. 
the two softwares you can see have very similar uh, trends and overall end up with a similar exit counts as the real data. So overall, uh, any of the differences are quite small and can be attributed to the idealization of the real movement speeds. So from these two graphs, we can definitely conclude um, that the movement speeds were successfully validated. Now, the heritage modeling um, is still underway, but the first iteration focused both on new exits that were created during recent renovations and any elements that obstruct egress. So a series of models were created to represent the building at different stages during its lifespan, most notably before and after major renovations that introduced, again, new elements and also new emergency exits to the building. The one example is the entrance and foyer, um, where a new tower that sits on top of that entrance um, added columns that sit directly in front of the two doors that are highlighted in the photo. As discussed with the model verification, the main entrance is the main exit used during emergency egress, so any obstructions in that path could have a significant impact on the overall egress of the building. Here you can see the SketchUp model with and without the columns that are in front of these entrance doors. This is an example of some of the changes made between the model analyses um, to be able to isolate the effects of certain changes to the building. So models were also created with combinations of elements um, that all exist together in reality, such as um, the building without the columns, but still with the new staircase or the model without the stairs and columns altogether. Um, these different iterations were done to help identify which of the alterations had the most significant impact on egress and therefore is most worth the potential loss of heritage character um, that is at risk when you make any changes to a building. Another focus uh, with the heritage analysis was the additional uh, back and side exits that we discussed a bit earlier. These are highlighted in the model shown on the slide. Uh, these exits are mostly connected to stairwells that connect uh, all four floors of the building as well as the basement level. So because the heritage investigation is still underway, um, we're still in the process of finding more information about the original floor plan, um, including whether these stairwells were always present. But even with our preliminary analysis, uh, that includes the staircases, but removes the exits that we know are not original. Remember that there were only those three original exits uh, when the building was constructed. We can see that those additional exits uh, had the most significant impact on the emergency egress of the cultural center of all of the elements that we considered. So further analysis will work towards refining the model, um, making it more in line with what the original building was um, and more specifically what changes were made. And so that we can really quant start to quantify um, the egress improvement of each of these elements. So these preliminary analyses are just the beginning of tackling egress modeling for heritage buildings. Outside of the building layout itself, um, we'll be addressing the social and demographic changes of the population during the cultural center's operation over 100 years. Um, that's of great interest to us to be able to really quantify what the performance of the building would have been when it was built and how much of an improvement was made um, during these renovations as uh, the demographics of the population change over time. So this research is ongoing and will soon include the analysis of a third scenario recorded at the Cultural Center, um, parametric analyses to compare the decision making between software A and B, and also the continuation of the heritage investigations as discussed. But the goals of this first step were met with verifying the Cultural Center model, validating the movement speeds, and of course, um, in beginning the heritage investigations. 
I want to thank you for listening to my presentation. Again, my name is Georgette Haroon and my supervisor is John Gales. I also wanted to extend special thanks to the Human Behavior and Evacuation Skills Team and the Accessible Environmental uh, Environments Team within AREP, Lund University for preliminary technical technical discussions and the SFP Foundation. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay, so we're live now. So we'll just wait a minute, get some numbers to increase and wait for some questions. So thanks for joining us here. Thank you both for being available for the Q&A. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's probably thanks. easier in your time zone than our friends in Australia or Singapore who are having to bail out right now. So yeah, that's yep. great. It's a very reasonable time right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was a uh, really tried to layer it. Okay, here we go. So how expensive slash complex is that Kinesia setup? Maybe you have a comparison to Azure Connect. Yeah, this one I'm gonna pass on to John. Okay, well, I, I, I can handle the, the software stuff. Um, uh, uh, the This is an open source software, so uh, it's relatively in its raw version free. However, when you're going to do modifications that we had to do, um, you're going to need to spend a lot on a graduate student, is what I, is what I would say. So, uh, t Tim is not cheap. It's, so, a labor, it's all in labor, not, not licensing, huh? <laughs> in, in some cases, but this isn't intended for anything other than to say that, you know, there are tools out there that, you know, you can be, that you can be looking at and then uh, creating some innovative solutions. When you do it by hand, it, it yeah, it's just not feasible. So you collected speed and pre-evacuation time. What about local density? Um, we do have that information from all the scenarios, but um, it wasn't inputted into this model. Uh, during the initial phases, we were just looking at those uh, the three elements that we inputted. Um, so we just used the general um, spread that the software produced. Okay, and then how did you calibrate the exit choice in the models? So like assigning target exits or setting only the conditions, um, depending on how you calibrate this input, um, we call this verification or validation. Yeah, um, so we used the uh, real exit data. So the percentages um, change for scenario one, we used um, how many people actually use those exits. So it didn't use any of the software's um, decision making for which exits were used. It was uh, the real data because we were we wanted to isolate just the movement speed um, in this iteration. Great. And then um, kind of looking towards the future in terms of change in population characteristics, are there any plans to predict the future egress requirements of the building that may be required based on an extrapolation of existing data? Um, not at this time, but that's a really interesting question. And it's something that we did want to explore by looking to the past. We would also be looking to the future. And I know uh, we do, we're paid careful attention also to cell phone usage and other um, studies of this particular data. And that's something that uh, will definitely be impact, is impacting us now, but especially more in the future. Um, so it'd be interesting to find any other um, elements that would in fact impact future populations. Great, great. And then um, just a comment here, Enrico is just saying, Canovia is actually designed for sports science analysis. The main problem he found was dealing with distortion of camera angles. Did you find something similar there? Yeah, I'll jump in on that one. Um, so the video feeds that we had to use were uh, CCTV uh, uh, footage. So part of the post-processing that we had to develop was a way to adjust to the frame rate that was really slow uh, in, these, uh, in these videos. So in this particular study, uh, because we were uh, restricted to what frame we had. We, had. we didn't have much control over it, so it did require a lot of going back. But we felt that because we had uh, three specific scenarios of egress, we really only covered two here, uh, the time was worth being developing specific post-processing for this particular uh, building. So that's about the, the most we can say right now about what, we, what we've done with, uh, with that software. 
Interesting, great. Um, yeah, some just commentary. The progress with the tools is amazing. Five years ago, you had people wearing giant arrows on their heads to process that. And maybe in five more, we'll just take some CCTV data and be good with it and just be able to extract exactly what we want. Yeah, but it, but it all depends on the quality of it. Like that, like you can, I, I believe we showed some of the videos of it and it's very, uh, very difficult to see. In some ways that's actually good because it obscures people's faces. So you can't really tell who, there's a lot of privacy protection with poor CT, CCTV, <laughs> but uh, in some of our stadium studies, uh, we have a lot more control on what we can put into uh, the types of angles that we're trying to capture and then the uh, specific surveying to correlate to those angles. And I suppose if a sports match or something, if everyone's wearing the same jerseys and masks from COVID, you'd be, it's super hard to track who's oh. who moving around in the crowd. So. Can add a bit more for your privacy if you're having you issues uh, getting approval. <laughs> right, right. All right, great. Um, and yeah, just a comment about density le density levels here. So uh, mm -hmm. let's see if there's any other qu questions or comments. I don't see any here. Yeah. Great. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap that then since I don't see anything else coming in. So thank you both again for your presentation and, and your work and the Q&A session here. Really appreciate your participation. Yeah. Well, thank you for organizing it and making everything so seamless. Yeah, there's a lot going on behind the scenes, Eric and Brian and the whole crew and all of our time. So it's been it's uh, well worth it so far. So thank you. You guys make it worth it. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Take care. Bye.